this is this is a collection of World War One materials that, that we pulled, and so when people come to research, you know, if they are depending on what they want to research, we have uh, again 200 plus years of very history, and so um, our next big step is to uh, digitize our index and digitize our most important collections. But uh, we are a traditional research library. People come in, let us know what they want to look at, we'll pull the documents, pull the boxes, and um, they are here to They research. can touch and feel it. Yes. Now, how long will it take you to digitize everything? About three years, we mm. think. Wow. <laughs> and that's, that's just the most important collections. We're talking about 40,000. Wow. pages a year for about three years and there's a lot more than that. I had mentioned we still are uh, finishing up all of our renovations and our exhibit building. We have 11 new exhibits that we are constructing and I'd say overall we're 90 plus percent finished and in the next month we will be completed by July 17th. One of the things that's, that's missing there is we are installing a high security case that uh, will house two really important relics for Erie. One of them is Commodore Perry's telescope from the Battle of Lake Erie, Whoa. which he gave then to General Harrison, who would become the ninth president of the United States, William Henry Harrison, and the telescope would stay in the Harrison family for um, 200 years, and now we have it. And also Perry's sword from the Battle of Lake Erie. Wow. So, that those those are kind of uh, two high-profile pieces that we want to get people in the spirit of seeing our greatest hits, right. and so we're we're finishing that corner. Um, but one of the nice things about this room, and of course, we have the map of the campus, and we'll have brochures over there. But what we did here is we took an 1855 map of Erie County, and um, uh, all the number dots are. Uh, other historic sites to see in Erie County. So somebody, especially from out of the area, comes and they can see all the things that we do. And even, frankly, a lot of people in Erie County don't know, you know, other uh, places. And so we are giving them the opportunity to uh, to uh, do a little exploring. So, so the story you mentioned before, I assume that's not going on eBay. You're going to keep it here for a while. The, the telescope and the and it tells, yeah. No, they're, they're, they're permanent. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, it's the last case that's going to go in. Okay. It's a it's a high security case. It's the same type of case that the uh, presidential libraries use for their high security items. Oh. Um, for instance, this case, a uh, twin of it, um, it holds um, Saddam Hussein's um, personal pistol in the George Bush Library. Hmm. Our archives, our collections, it's um, uh, humidity controlled, um, security, um, temperature controlled, so it's a state of the art type of facility. We'd been in the library earlier. We have uh, several ranges of books. Um, uh, we have a uh, extensive Civil War collection um, of books. These are all Civil War books documents, original letters, hundreds of original letters um, that uh, pertain to northwestern Pennsylvania. And um, so this is, uh, we have a couple more ranges full of books downstream here, but uh, uh, we're just, um, you know, we can't put them all out there. So again, people, if they're researching for something, we'll, we'll either bring them out here. But if you look down this way, uh, these ranges are filled with, um, boxes of um, artifacts. If you put all the boxes end to end, we've got about two miles worth of boxes. Wow. It's like you saw out in the library. And here, we have 15,000 glass plate negatives from um, 100 plus years ago of, um, from three different photographers who, uh, who did photography in Erie. And so again, people can research if they are looking for a, a ancestor or figure. This is interesting, this whole back wall. These are plans for the last hundred years of public buildings in Erie. So 
um, architectural buildings of um, everything that uh, got built here in our, uh, are in, in these files. And we also use modern technology in terms of uh, warehouse type technology where we uh, barcode um, things so that generally um, if somebody is looking for an artifact, it's in our computer, uh, we can pull it up and have it um, out for exhibit in 10 minutes. This is our workspace for our curatorial department and we have many things, um, all kinds of widgets. Uh, uh, that's, by the way, that's Conrad Perry's sword, which is going to be oh. the case. Wow, oh. that's it. Picture, please. Wow, that is a part of American history. But we have fabrics, uh, dresses, uh, statues, old typewriters, accounting machines, you name it, that has to do with Erie history in some fashion. We have it. And so what we do up here is we process these pieces. We photograph them there, and then they get put into our program, um, which is called Past Perfect. And uh, we've got several workstations up here where people are um, plugging away. But um, it goes into the database. It uh, gets boxed. It gets labeled. And it gets shelved. We have over 1,400 framed pieces of art, which we are re-inventorying um, in, uh, in order to uh, get a good digital index on all, this, all the stuff we have. You know, there are tens of thousands of pieces that we have. Those are all Mark's toys over there that were made here in Erie. Well, this will keep you busy for a while. It does. <laughs> Our curator has an assistant and usually a cadre of um, interns and volunteers. We have some more art racks here, which Oh, wow. Various paintings or photographs, framed items on them. You take a quick look in there. There's a, uh, there's a Civil War flag on, on oh. the Hi. Now, this room is a dual purpose. Um, the first part of it uh, is set up as Erie in the American Dream. However, we've made some space. Uh, we have we have a couple of large kiosks that will normally occupy that space, but because we're getting uh, the large automobile in Frank Lloyd Wright's court, we've moved those out so that we can bring the car, which will be parked there. And so the Hearing the American Dream talks about uh, what Erie was famous for when we boomed, you know, the oil and engine capital of the world. We talk about uh, several of our industries. Uh, we show you know, small tools and steam engines that uh, were manufactured here, including horseshoes, interestingly. It's a um, 1907 uh, Erie Daily Times newspaper, and look at the headline. General Electric plant will come to Erie for a certainty. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, with my dad, my uncles, and lots of friends who work there, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, I thought that would be kind of an interesting piece to have in. And if you look up, you'll see one of our collection of Tribune bicycles. They were made here in Erie for several years. Um, one, it wasn't this particular bike, but one of the same model um, actually set the uh, world uh, speed record, land speed record for a bike in the late 1890s. Got it up to 60 miles an hour. I wow, that's pretty They had a drafting behind a train. <laughs> you 
and then coming around to here, this will be another piece which uh, people ought to find interesting. It's the eagle that was on the um, uh, paddle box for the um, uh, paddle at DC 1843. So when they scrapped the ship, they saved that. But then as, as people will move around, by the way, I mentioned the car. Mm -hmm. um, there's a photograph of the car at the Franklin Wright uh, design gas station. So that'll be sitting here uh, from July to October. Uh, besides architecture, uh, Wright was a real car guy. And so he actually had a fleet of these Crosley hotshots um, that he, uh, he always had a lot of apprentices and acolytes, and they used to uh, tool around and carry it to these things. Um, this is not one of Wright's, uh, we actually found it on eBay and refurbished <laughs> it um, because uh, little cars like this did, just didn't last um, for the last three quarters of a century. But as we come around to this area, this is where we get into architecture. And um, we have um, a couple of interactives. Um, this is a, uh, a great piece because it has well over a thousand buildings and homes in Erie that uh, would have been um, uh, pre-World War II. And we do it by location, by style, um, et cetera. Then we also have on the other side a uh, nice interactive for kids, which uh, is a, um, uh, they can build their own houses. It's a Minecraft game. So uh, it'll get them a chance to, you know, uh, get into and be interested in, uh, in uh, architecture, which of course this half of the gallery is all about. That wall is um, filled with um, prominent theory buildings. And as we get over to the left-hand side of that wall, these are uh, this, these last three houses are similar in style, inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright. And then this little map here shows the other Frank Lloyd Wright sites in the region, from Buffalo to Falling Waters, east of Pittsburgh. And what we hope to do is create a Frank Lloyd Wright trail. Um, between Falling Waters and Buffalo with Erie as the linchpin of it. And uh, people follow Frank Lloyd Wright loyally. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are signed up on various uh, sites um, that are dedicated to Wright through the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation and the Conservancy. And so uh, they're already have welcomed us as part of their family. And so we're hoping to um, build on that and uh, when you have you know, 80 to 100 to 200,000 people coming through some of these other sites, we would love to see you know, a portion of them stop here in Erie to see the sure. office. And those are regional, those are all the regional sites that uh, uh, we have from Falling Waters, famously up on the upper right uh, throughout uh, his other uh, works here. This is a bridge that was um, designed by Wright in the um, uh, early 50s to span uh, San Francisco Bay. Um, he did not like steel girder type of, uh, of bridges. And uh, this was a revolutionary concept of reinforced concrete that soared 200 feet above the water. Um, the powers that be, unfortunately, in San Francisco decided not to build it, but it was revolutionary in concept, in construction, and he even, for commuters, <laughs> put in a park in the middle of the bridge. So I guess if you're driving home in the 1960s and you want to stop off and get a cigarette and walk around the trees, there you go. So this model is 17 feet long. What do you mean? Put, on the, uh, put it on the uh, uh, right style table. We have about 18 feet of exhibit for people to look at and uh, walk around. Brand new exhibit. Um, we uh, uh, purchased it, uh, well, our 
donor purchased it for us three years ago, and we built this building to essentially house it. And so the inside of the office is identical to what you would have seen uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright was working um, in the decade or so that he spent in San Francisco until he passed away. Uh, the, the ceilings, the dimensions are accurate to a sixteenth of the inch, and everything inside, um, except for a couple of these uh, photographs out at the very front, were all in the office at the time. Oh. Wright and his partner Aaron Green um, worked there, and um, uh, the office finally closed um, in, I believe it was 1988. It was disassembled. It was purchased by a private person, um, later lent to Carnegie Mellon. They had it for about a decade, and uh, then it's been out of circulation for the last 15 years. What was interesting was, when it was at Carnegie Mellon, uh, the windows that you'll see, people looked in but never walked through. So this is really the first time the public um, has ever been able to walk through this office. Anybody walking through in the 50s would have been a client of, of Wright's or Aaron Green's. So uh, this is the first time. So we're really excited. We're getting a lot of good feedback from the uh, uh, people that follow Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, they're very excited about coming to Erie and walking in the footsteps. It's like, it's like a pilgrimage for them. Yes. <laughs> Original door in his favorite color, Cherokee red. Um, we have two of these tiles, which are his signature on his, uh, uh, on his major works. Um, red ceramic tile with FLLW um, uh, on it. So this is the reception area. And here on the shelf, we have uh, Wright's original drawing of the Butterfly Bridge. The, the bridge was featured, the model of the bridge was featured in the movie Die Hard. Yeah. So there's a, <laughs> there's a photograph of the bridge with all the bad guys standing around. I do remember that scene. We have the reception area. We have the original stools, you know, that people would wait on, you know, the rather austere right style stools. The urn that's up on top or is, uh, is original to the office. <laughs> and then for uh, walking in here, we have the drafting room. And for full effect, if you look out here, this is the scene that they would have looked at <laughs> out of their second floor window. We, we had photographs done and a, um, a film put on our windows so that you're looking out at what they would have, have seen. Um, the drafting room is not quite finished yet. Uh, we have uh, plans for the office um, on the drafting tables. We, there's, there'll be another uh, set of plans for one of the houses that uh, Wright built in the San Francisco area and a model of that, which we will add to uh, as we're running up to this last month. Now, are, the, are these original plans that he actually drew? Or? Uh, yes, these, these are copies of the original plans. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and the, the original that he has, uh, that, um, has um, his handwritten notes all over it, which we have a photograph of before you come in. One more feature in, in this room, which uh, we will be putting up, is they have, they have a pegboard on that back wall right. full of photographs and drawings and things like that. So as we finish this, um, the structure is completely done. If you look up, the ceiling is exactly the way it was, but some of the items need to be filled in, which we're doing. And uh, this, this louvered look and the 120 degree angle rather than the 90 degree angle with these walls, all very typical of Wright's uh, style. Uh, we have substituted modern LED bulbs, but uh, this is actually the, the exact you know, lighting in the same spot, the same sockets that, uh, that Wright had in this office in the 50s. And then we come into Wright's personal office. 
and you see a, a, a different intimacy here with the low ceiling. Absolutely. And the, and the glass which diffuses the light through. Uh, he was a, a big aficionado of Asian art. This, uh, this screen was, uh, Japanese screen was right there in the original office in that uh, uh, drum-like piece. Uh, these seats are original to the office. We have his chair, which will go back in the, in the back corner. We haven't put in yet. But um, uh, this even you know, uh, covered his desk, and you can even see coffee stains on the, um, <laughs> on the covering. <laughs> uh. <laughs> he had a, uh, uh, a Taliesin in Wisconsin was his home and his main studio. And then in the late 30s, he went out to Scottsdale, Arizona, and created Taliesin West. And so Taliesin, Taliesin West are still owned by the foundation and are, are active uh, sites. But, um, you know, so he got into kind of the Southwest look too a little bit when he was, uh, when he was out in Arizona for 20 some years. So we're very excited about this. Um, again, first time anybody's ever been able to step foot inside this office um, uh, since the 50s and uh, except for the architects and their, um, their clients. So we're, we're very proud that we were able to bring it uh, here to Erie and hope that it will be a linchpin of a regional trail. Because it had land going back this way, mm -hmm. and we had land coming up, and it gave us the opportunity to put this new 6,000 square foot building in. A couple of really kind of fun architectural uh, things about this is the original house here was built in 1858 in the Italianate style and the bricks are different than modern bricks so we actually um, uh, when we built this addition on we actually had these bricks made for both color and size to match the original bricks from 1858 then we knew we were going to be building this building so we had enough bricks done for the facade. And then if you look behind, this barn actually predates everything else on the block. And it was built to um, house the mules that would pull the uh, barges along the Erie Extension Canal, which is right next door to us. So when we scraped everything down to the, to the original color, we came up with that red color um, and we built the second floor then of the new exhibit building with that, uh, the same board and batten style uh, construction and the same color so it all blends in. It was all thought out. Now over here, if you look at this panel and then look right behind us, that was the bed of the original canal. And the canal, would, could you, if you got on the water, at the Erie Bayfront, you could literally, by barge, get all the way to New Orleans. This connected us with the rest of the country. And I had a local artist um, do a conception of how this looked in 1860. So if you look on the left-hand side, you see the edge of the barn. <laughs> and as you're looking out, the water would be right in front of you. And then the, the city would be behind. So the Erie, so it's an extension to the canal, but the actual Erie Canal is... The Erie Canal runs from Albany on the Hudson River right. to um, Lockport on um, Lake Erie. Okay. Uh, that, the, essentially the length of the Mohawk Valley. The Erie Extension Canal is a completely separate item. They built a, num a number of canals that were like the super highways of the mid-1800s before the railroads came in. But this one connected, again, um, the Port of Erie uh, first of all, to the Ohio River, um, so that we could, um, instead of moving over roads, um, we could more quickly and more uh, inexpensively move goods and services back and forth from Erie to Pittsburgh. But you literally opened up Erie because you couldn't get over Niagara Falls and um, uh, opened up Erie to all the way to the Gulf Coast. When the canal went out of business, um, it was quickly filled in and um, a German builder by the name of Kuhn built 
uh, bought these two lots, one where the towpath went and one where the canal was. And the second building over is actually built over the canal bed. And the um, basement, if you stand in the basement, and he, he leveled these twin buildings so that they were, um, they were on the same plane. Um, if you go into the basement of that second building, the ceiling is 14 feet high because of the bed of the canal. <laughs> This gives you a nice view from here yeah. of the mansion and the, and the carriage house, which were built in 1891-1892. But this is dedicated to the extension canal. And eventually, and we're hoping it'll be in by July, but we have uh, uh, professors from Penn State Erie building us a, an interactive um, exhibit that will be, um, uh, kids will be able to to uh, look at canal locks and move boats up and down and all kinds of fun things. That's gonna go over in the corner there. But the rest of this, this whole room is dedicated to the, um, to the story of the Erie Extension Canal. Um, that big plank there actually was dug up when they were putting the building in at 12th and uh, Cherry Street, um, where the, the canal lock went through. What you see over here is this fascinating diagram a diorama, excuse me, of the canal in the late 1850s. And the detail is stunning. The, the couple that built this are professional model makers and they just went all out. Um, give you a couple of quick examples of how detailed and what you see here, this is a lock and uh, that's the pump house for the lock. And um, the boats would be raised up or um, would go down depending on, on which direction they were traveling. But things that people normally wouldn't notice, if you look over here on the side of the mill building, there are several um, what they call bills posted. In other words, posters with announcements or advertisements and whatnot. <clears throat> Our designers went to the trouble of actually finding copies of, of um, these posters from the 1850s in the Library of Congress, and they shrunk them down and put them on the side of the well, building. That's attention to detail. Another uh, really interesting detail is if you look at this barge, the barrels in the, uh, in the front of the barge, or the bow of the barge, we normally think of barrels that have metal stays to go around to hold them together. Back in the 1850s, they used ash wood. And so again, when they produced um, this model, they actually used ash wood as stays to go around the barrels in, in the model. There are many, many more details in here. Um, <clears throat> the home that's in, in the um, right hand corner, for instance, the lady has her washout. And um, again, they went and they found um, uh, quilts and blankets, um, photographs from that period of time, and they, um, they, they shrunk them down and actually put them on fabric. When we uh, carried this in, the wind was blowing and the wash was blowing in the breeze. <laughs> this was a 1852 map, and they have railroads and canals. And you can see the course of the canal going from Erie um, down and connecting with the Ohio River and ultimately to Pittsburgh. So the canal connected here um, and then um, you could take the Ohio River down from, uh, from there going to point south. So that's, that was where the canal was. And then after the canal became uneconomical because of the railroads, the railroad actually bought the right-of-way for the canal and, and the Erie and Pittsburgh Railroad was built on that right-of-way. This is a period photograph of the Erie Extension Canal. You can see the, the uh, horses and mules pulling the barges along. So the Erie Canal opened in 1825. The, 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 the Canal in New York State was 1825. And then this began to be built um, uh, 
in, in this era, the 1830s up to around 1840. So, and it was built in stages. The building we're in now is this building here, and the barn is right behind. And our Watson Curtsy Mansion is nothing but a field. <laughs> the people that own this house eventually sold the, the lot to the Watsons who built their mansion over there. But you can see in 1870 even how sparse the population was outside the main town and going up um, out State Street and Peach Street. Um, uh, Erie was still, um, you know, had a lot of wide open spaces. So this is our gallery, Erie and the Navy. Erie has a very long history of naval service, dating back to the War of 1812, Commodore Perry, and uh, most folks from Erie know that story, but our fleet uh, was built here in the Erie Bay, and it would go on to uh, defeat the, the British Navy presence on the Great Lakes and secure our western frontier. Um, and it was the first time in history that the British, who um, had a long history of naval dominance, were ever defeated and had a fleet captured was here on Lake Erie yeah. on September 10th of 1813. We also have um, the first iron hull warship ever built for the U.S. was built here in Erie. It was USS Michigan. A lot of people think of the white ship, which was the Wolverine, but that ship, this is the original, which was later repainted white when it went from the U.S. Navy to the Pennsylvania Navy Militia, um, which was the version of the National Guard. This ship, um, that's an 1866 photograph of it. It served a, a very important roles across a half a century. It um, rescued people. It fought pirates. It um, guarded the, um, uh, the uh, prison camp at Johnson's Island, which the Union Army, Union Go Federal Government put all of the Confederate officers that captured during the Civil War. It guarded it. Um, the Confederates tried to capture her um, uh, at one point to free the prisoners, and that, that was foiled. Um, it also, um, up in, um, uh, off of Buffalo, foiled an invasion of Canada by Union Army veterans who were Irish, the Finians. And so it, it played a key role in stopping that invasion of Canada by these armed ex-Union soldiers who wanted to free Canada in the name of Ireland. <laughs> now what you see back there, this is a, uh, uh, when you come on the gangway, um, you had two of these, what are uh, called headboards or side boys. Uh, we have one of them here. We have one on loan to the Maritime Museum. But um, everybody who would come on uh, board to the Michigan, starting in about 1880, would pass through um, one of these uh, uh, gangway headboards. But if you ever want to see a piece of the true cross from the Niagara, there is a... Um, uh, framing timber or rib um, that came off the Niagara when she was raised in 1913. Hmm. Here's some more scenes from uh, the Michigan. These, these are all early 1900 sailors. Um, this was on the deck of the Michigan, but it was a winter shot because they have a frame built over the main deck. But you can see a gun here and um, Early electricity, you see, actually you can see the bulbs hanging down um, from the ceiling. We have a number of these guys identified, not all of them, but um, the Michigan, um, followed by the Wolverine, was called the Guardian of the Great Lakes um, from 1843 when she was launched in Erie all the way to 1923 when uh, one of her um, engines blew out and they did not uh, uh, replace it after that. Um, that's Daniel Dobbins, who uh, was responsible for getting um, the president to um, authorize the fleet to be built in Erie. He was a famous uh, Erie merchant. His wife, a couple of original oil paintings. So it's Dobbins Landing is named after him, yes. I would assume. Okay. Yes. 
and then a piece of the keel of the Lawrence, which was Niagara's sister ship. Um, the sextant over here, navigation piece, was the sextant that um, uh, Perry used on, on the Lawrence, again, the Niagara sister ship, and he gave it to Dobbins um, in appreciation for what he did. Dobbins' cane, Perry's plate, um, a lantern that was uh, used um, in the fleet, and uh, very interestingly here, this is a one-of-a-kind piece. This musket was built um, for Pennsylvania service, contracted by the state, and it was built in western Pennsylvania. We know it was. Um, it's called a Baker musket. But what makes it unique, and it's literally one of a kind, it is marked for the uh, militia regiment that guarded Erie and the building of the fleet during the War of 1812. It's the only one of its kind, and we have it here in the museum, courtesy of a um, uh, collector who um, wanted to share it with us. The house was built by this gentleman. Surgeon William Maxwell Wood. For a number of years, he served as the fleet surgeon um, uh, on the Michigan and uh, was a uh, Navy fleet surgeon for the Great Lakes. He would later go on to become the first Surgeon General of the Navy. He built this house in 1858. He'd been in Erie for a number of years, had treated um, uh, President Tyler here, um, and had been a uh, would, would, as I mentioned, go on to other duties with the Navy. Very interesting career. The Navy actually named four ships after him. So he was the builder of the house. If you lean in and look in this little alcove here, this was an add-on, um, and this was the little uh, office of Captain William Morrison, who was, uh, whose parents purchased the house from Dr. Wood and Morrison would live here throughout his life. He would be the last captain of the Wolverine and the first uh, uh, superintendent of Presque Isle State Park. And that's his picture there, more of an eerie in the Navy. Um, the theme here is freshwater to saltwater, where you see the, uh, the model and the photographs of the Michigan, which would become the Wolverine when it was converted to the Pennsylvania Naval Militia, and it was painted white. And what's fascinating about this is for 50 years, the Michigan Wolverine served as a training ship for young naval officers. And so much so, so many naval officers passed through Erie that they married many Erie girls, <laughs> and Erie got nicknamed the mother-in-law of the Navy. <laughs> the mother-in-law of the Navy. This case is not completed yet, but it honors um, our patron here at the Hagen History Center, um, Captain Thomas Hagen, who was a um, uh, retired uh, Navy captain supply corps. And his grandfather was also a Naval captain uh, who uh, spent uh, uh, service in both World War I and World War II. And um, they lived across the street. Tom Hagen literally grew up across the street from this building. And um, so the story goes that uh, uh, Captain Bailey, who would become a great friend of Captain Morrison, uh, the two old guys would get together over here in the little alcove, which was Morrison's uh, study. And they would talk about the Navy and old times. And um, sure enough, Little Tom Hagen would come with his grandfather and sit at the great man's knees. And um, I'm sure, just like my grandfather, who is a career naval officer, um, he, got, he was fascinated by, and it became part of his career path to uh, go into the Navy himself. The painting behind you is an original that was done of the USS Erie. It was a, um, uh, I would, call it, as in terms of um, modern hull design, pretty close to a modern frigate. It was built in the uh, 1930s. It was torpedoed and sunk during World War II in the Caribbean. And uh, we just uh, received this, uh, this painting uh, recently, and we're um, designing a little bit more exhibit around it. But uh, it was a great ship, and um, the hull design 
would later be used by the Coast Guard for the largest of the Coast Guard cutters, um, is, is the design from the Erie class uh, naval ships. One name that is familiar around town, Gridley. Um, Charles Vernon Gridley was not from Erie, but like so many others, he came and he served on the Michigan as executive officer. He would then marry an Erie girl, um, uh, actually Strawn Vincent's uh, niece, and um, uh, would, um, when he passed away in Japan, um, they brought him back. And um, this is Gridley Circle um, at Lakeside Cemetery with the uh, Spanish cannons from the forts around Manila, which he was responsible as the uh, uh, captain of the flagship for capturing in the Spanish-American War. Now here, this case is interesting and particularly poignant for me. Um, we're using this case as a representation of this freshwater, saltwater. Uh, the uh, young man who um, would spend 31 years in the Navy um, grew up on Second and Peach. Um, he uh, joined the Navy at the age of 16 and um, would spend uh, in 1916 and spend the next 31 years in the Navy, both World Wars. Um, saw some uh, terrific combat, um, especially in the Second World War. His uniform, medals, his helmet, Japanese helmet that he picked up on Guadalcanal. Um, he was uh, uh, in that uh, terrific campaign. Um, and um, he's my grandfather. Oh, okay. That's great. His name was George Goodall. <laughs> so just like the smaller model over there, we have this wonderful larger model of the, uh, of the uh, Wolverine um, after 1905 when it was repainted. This hallway um, has a couple interesting features uh, historic to the house, of course. All the architecture in the house, and you can um, uh, see this, is, is all original. Um, and the stairway, of course, is we, we added that rail for ADA purposes, but uh, this is the original stairway, uh, beautifully done. Um, this mirror uh, is close to 150 years old, and it has been in this, uh, the, the house or the family, actually, uh, of the Morrisons, returned it to us about three years ago. And um, so it's back where it was historically in the hall. The purchasers of the home from Surgeon Wood um, was this couple, Leverett and uh, Missouri or Sue um, uh, Morrison. And he was a uh, ship's channeler, which means that he sold supplies um, to the uh, various uh, commercial shipping and Navy along the waterfront. And uh, they had three children, only one of them survived, and that was William Morrison, the captain, who would um, have this house until he passed away in the 1950s. You see here is the, um, uh, this next gallery, this military gallery, is honoring um, Vice Admiral Thomas Weschler from Erie, who passed away recently. Um, but uh, uh, this is not the story of battles. This is um, the story of people from Erie who served our country. Now we do have um, a number of really interesting artifacts and the story of George Washington, who as a young major in the British Army came to Erie um, County in the, um, at the beginning of the French and the Indian War. So we come in here and uh, we start chronologically this is the story of George Washington at Fort LaBeouf. This is from his journal. Okay. Um, this is a uh, drawing, a painting of the uh, 18 or excuse me, 1763 burning of the fort at Presque Isle by during Pontiac's rebellion, uh, Indian Chief Pontiac. These are relics that have been excavated from the fort area um, at the um, down by the bayfront, near the foot of Parade Street. Now, anybody who was probably 40 or over in Erie um, at one point came here as a school kid and saw the infamous Anthony Wayne Pott. 
Um, the story goes, Anthony Wayne, commander of the U.S. Army, dies in Erie. And um, uh, 13 years later, he's buried here, of course, 13 years later, his son comes from the Philadelphia area to take the bones back and bury them in the family plot. They open up the casket, and if you look there, there's some of the pieces of the old casket in that frame. They open it up, and General Wayne looks like he died the day before. <laughs> so what do you do? It's, it's summer. It's going to take you six weeks to get back to Philadelphia. You're not going to put a, a body in the back of your cart to, um, to ride back to Philly. So Wayne's old uh, army surgeon, who still lived in the area, Dr. Wallace, who Wallace Street is named for, um, came up with the idea of cutting the flesh off the bones and um, then the bones could go back and the flesh and his uniform would be reburied in Erie. Well, um, not to be facetious, but anytime you've ever tried to eat a chicken wing, you know there's always flesh left on no matter how, how tight you get. So the answer was to boil the rest of the flesh off the bones. And so uh, when this pot used to be in the basement of the museum, and it was kind of dark and dank, it probably scared generations of kids when they were told this story, but that's the pot that Anthony Wayne was boiled in. Um, and his son then was able to gather up the bones, take them back to Philadelphia. There is a, there, there is a ghost story that goes along with it, as so many things are. Um, allegedly, a couple of the bones fell out of the uh, cart on the way back, and so Wayne's birthday, which is January 1st, every year he's supposed to haunt the area along US 322, which was the path that his son took back to Philadelphia, looking for his dead bones. So it's a cute story to tell kids. <laughs> and the uh, chair beside it um, is the chair that Wayne died in. Um, he died in what is known today as the Wayne Blockhouse in the old fort at the, um, the last of the three forts that were built at the foot of um, Parade Street area. Moving along to the War of 1812, these are some, these are some interesting relics of, from the war. That yoke for oxen uh, was used um, when they cut the trees down to build the fleet. Um, the oxen moved them um, uh, to the site, and that yoke was preserved from those days that was used to help build the fleet. We have a militia uh, hat or shako, a couple of swords, uh, some other pieces that um, are, are relics of Erie's building of Perry's fleet. And if you turn around, uh, we have uniforms from the uh, Spanish-American War, uh, World War I. This was uh, uh, Bishop Rogers Israel, who uh, would, at the age of 60, would volunteer to go over to France as a chaplain in the Army. Um, this is Elvira Manarelli. She's a great story. She was a hairdresser in Erie, volunteered for the war, um, went to war, came back, went back to being a hairdresser again. And finally, um, in this case, importantly, we don't have a uniform for him, but if you zoom in on this gentleman, his name was Kenneth Ahrens. And Ahrens was from Erie. He was in the uh, Battle of the Bulge and the unit that he was serving with was captured by the SS. And these Nazi fanatics, um, after they captured the Americans, slaughtered them at a place called Malmendy in Belgium. And he was one of only a couple of survivors um, that survived the massacre. He uh, uh, laid on the ground, another man fell on top of him, bled all over him, and um, they didn't realize he was still alive. So this photograph, is from the war crimes trials at Dachau. We all have heard about the Nuremberg trials, but the US military war crimes trials were at the old concentration camp at Dachau. And so all the uh, Nazis from that unit um, who had been identified by 1946 were put on trial. And what you see here is his original briefing book, which has a photograph and, and kind of mini biography of each of the uh, of the men that were on trial. And he's seen here testifying where the prosecutor has asked him, um, and when, when the, the Germans opened fire 
what were you doing? And he's there saying, we had our arms up and surrender. So that's a, a very poignant, eerie story. These are original posters for war bonds from World War I and World War II. We talk a little bit just in general about American service and the Civil War, the Plains Indians War, Spanish-American War, and the two world wars, and, and again, talk about Erie sacrifice. For instance, um, uh, you know, 14,000 uh, men and men were drafted, or men and women volunteered from Erie. Um, 728 were killed in the Second World War. Um, in the Plains Indians Wars, this house had an interesting uh, story with it because the son of Surgeon Wood, who grew up in this house, would become, uh, would go to West Point, become a lieutenant, um, would serve in the Plains Indians War in one of the last major campaigns was the capture of um, Chief Joseph in the Nez Perce, which was uh, a tribe that dominated the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. And uh, Erkstrom Wood, who was the young man who grew up in this house, was at the surrender as an aide to General Howard. And he's the one that recorded uh, Chief Joseph's famous words, which were, my heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And so um, uh, Lieutenant Woods recorded that, one of the famous phrases from, from uh, uh, Native American heritage here in this country. And uh, he would go on to become a great friend of Chief Joseph in their later lives. Moving um, chronologically a little forward, um, this is more modern service. Um, uh, we have talked about the Cold War, Korea, Vietnam. These are all men who served. There's a guy from Erie sitting on a captured uh, Russian motorcycle in the Korean War. This is Colonel John Boyd, who is one of the most important uh, uh, military thinkers for the Air Force in the last part of the 20th century. He's from Erie. Um, if you look behind you, um, these are a group of, of uh, men, primarily from northwestern Pennsylvania, um, uh, training um, as part of National Guard unit. Then over here, this is, uh, these are uniforms from uh, guys from Erie County. Um, uh, the center one is Tom Ridge. Um, he was a sergeant in Vietnam. That's his uniform from Vietnam. We also have Joe Fott who um, is very active in Veterans Affairs here in Erie, and he's the driving force for bringing that, uh, that, that frigate to Erie, the uh, Perry-class frigate, if, they, if it does come. Uh, Joe is primarily responsible. He was a major in Kosovo during the, uh, during the 90s. Um, this is Greg Henning, um, his Gulf War uniform. He's a, currently a teacher in the North, uh, Northeast School District. Um, and so we tell their stories here, too. We're going to be running a loop of um, soldiers, women, sailors um, who have uh, served their country from Erie. Um, we're doing that in cooperation with WQLN. And uh, when we fire it up, that loop will uh, regularly, it's about a 15 minute loop, but you can, um, as you pass through, you can have a seat here and hear stories of, of people from their service in Erie. Um, of course, war has to do a lot with death. Um, this wall is very poignant. Um, uh, this is a soldier who passed away, um, died in war, uh, his funeral out at uh, Wesleyville Methodist Church um, uh, during the Gulf War. Um, what you see here in front of you, this case, um, young sergeant by the name of Jesse Salajak. Uh, Jesse would be drafted uh, right out of graduation Academy High School. He'd go to war in World War II. Um, he'd be highly decorated. Um, he would then be killed um, toward the end of the war in the Hurtgood Forest. And what is, I think, particularly poignant about this is when they sent he was buried in uh, one of the military cemeteries in Europe, but they set the flag from his casket, which you see the same thing they do then and before and now, but um, his mother never was able to open 
box with his flag. The first time this flag was ever out of the box was when the family gave it to us and we decided to put it on display. You know, very tough, very poignant story. Here's another poignant story. As I mentioned, Admiral Weschler, um, uh, who this room is named after, uh, served in World War II. His older brother, um, who is a, a lieutenant commander during, the, during World War II, Charles Weschler, that's his photograph at the Naval Academy, and his epaulets and, and chapeau, um, was captured in the Philippines in uh, 1942. And there's a, a, a newspaper photograph of, of him in his, uh, uh, just before he was captured. He survived three years in Japanese prison camps, which were brutal. Um, but when the American forces invaded the Philippines, um, the Japanese decided they would try to ship out all of the um, uh, American prisoners or kill them, one or the other. He was on a ship which was unmarked and the Japanese did not put red crosses or any identification saying that these were prisoner ships. And so they were, his ship uh, was torpedoed and bombed. We actually sent two ships out from under him as a prisoner. He was killed during the second sinking. And um, which, is, which is a tragedy, especially when you look at this photograph down here. That's his daughter Mimi. And that is Christmas of 1944. And she is, this actually made, Nash, this photograph made national news. She's there praying um, for her daddy's safe return. Mimi still lives in Erie. And uh, she's the one that gave us this story and, um, uh, and the uh, items from her dad's uh, military service. So that's the sort of thing that we really want to emphasize, not just the deaths, right. but we want to talk about people who served for Mary, served proudly, why they went to war, um, their experiences since they've returned. Um, and we want, it, we want people to come in here and see themselves. Um, for instance, the, the young lady who's from Erie who's uh, loading a, uh, a bomb on, onto a plane on an aircraft carrier, she's from Erie. The young guy with his dog, who was uh, the dog's a bomb-sniffing dog. The other young man who's throwing a ball um, from, the, uh, from the top of his tank to a bunch of refugee kids in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, the, uh, the, the folks here, um, the sergeant, the uh, lady who is uh, supervising, um, we want to have, when people come here, we want to have them think of their own family stories, um, share them with us, um, but we want people to see that um, uh, service goes a long way back, but it covers the broad spectrum of men, women, regardless of race, regardless of uh, creed. Um, uh, Erie has a, has a beautiful history of national service.